letting him know he's number one. He's been there right from the start, doing his thing, playing his part. Most of the time, I fought him hard, tuned him out, play my guitar. Good day, everyone. It's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Today, we're going to talk about relationship, hearing, and obeying. This is going to be an interesting, you, you probably want to take some notes here. It's some good stuff. I got it during prayer. I'm going to start out with this scripture because I was just about, I had some notes here, and it's like the Lord wanted me to impress upon you this scripture. Luke 8, 21, my mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Now, I've been meditating on Matthew seven twenty one through 23 for several years now. The Lord recently has shown me something that I want to share with you, and it's really cool. <laughs> it's really nice. It's awesome. Whenever, you know, one of the ways we hear from God is if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he's also, you know, John chapter 1, he's also the Word. You know, when we meditate upon the Word, we're meditating on the way, the truth, and the life. And the Spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. And what's amazing is it's that moment when God, the Spirit of truth, illuminates a scripture for you. It's just an amazing experience. So I urge you to do that. Spend some time with God. And this is something that I got just meditating on this few verses here. Matthew seven twenty one through 23. You've heard me read it a thousand times. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I have drilled this home thousands of times. I mean, you you know I read this verse over and over and over because it's very important. There's, it illustrates that there's going to be people that think they're Christians, and they're not. They notice they call Jesus Lord. And I've noticed some stuff recently, some interesting revelations, some rocks of revelation that I'm going to pour out to you that uh, you might find exciting. These people who think they're Christians, you know, they think they're Christians, but they're not, obviously. They don't have a relationship with Christ. And the title of this podcast is Relationship, Hearing, and Obeying. These people obviously didn't have a relationship with Christ, and having a relationship with Jesus is paramount. You cannot hear his voice. You cannot hear his voice if you don't have a relationship with him. In John chapter 10, over and over, we see that Christians will hear the voice of Jesus. In Hebrews 12.25, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. So we're supposed to hear him, God, the Father God, the Spirit of truth, Father God resides in heaven, our Father who's in heaven. We're supposed to hear him. Now, why am I talking about hearing the voice of God? Because these guys in Matthew seven twenty one and 23, these people, they obviously didn't hear his voice. Think about it. They did all these works, but Jesus said, I don't know you. I never knew you. And they were doing these Christian-looking things, but apparently they were not hearing from God. These people that say they were prophesying, casting out demons, and doing miracles, they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He clearly says, depart from me, I never knew you. So they were not hearing his voice. Now, remember when Jesus said he only does what the Father, he sees the Father do? Now, think about that. Well, I'm going to read the scripture. It's John five nineteen and 20, but think about it. He's seeing in the Spirit. Um, then Jesus Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. Now, if you meditate on that a bit, think about when Jesus spit into the mud, Uh, and made some clay and put it in the the blind man's eyes. You know, he saw the Father do it first. He said here, I only do what I see the Father do, right? So he was seeing in the Spirit. He didn't have a scriptural mandate to spit into dirt 
and make clay. Not that I can think of. Jesus also says that what, what on, only what the Father teaches him. In John eight twenty eight, then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now, you know, these two verses about Jesus only doing what he sees the Father do, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. So Jesus basically is so dis- disciplined, like Romans 12.1. Let me find that scripture real quick. In Romans 12.1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I mean, Jesus, he was, his whole life was only about doing what he saw the Father do and saying what the Father taught him. I mean, that was an amazing discipline. And, you know, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. So Jesus was faithful to do what the Father showed him, and he was faithful to do what the Father revealed to him. Keep in mind, again, God is a spirit. God is a spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4.24 God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So Jesus, when he sees the Father doing something, he's seeing in the spirit, okay? So in case I'm going too fast here, uh, Jesus is seeing and hearing in the spirit. We are to do likewise. You know, Paul says, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, this uh, Christian is a person that must operate in the spirit. So I want to kind of re-clarify three points that I've made so far. Number one, the Christian must have a relationship. We must have a relationship with God. Number two, God is a spirit. God is a spirit. So this means, in turn, number three, a Christian is a person who hears and sees in this, the Father in the spiritual realm because, number one, they have a relationship and they understand that God's a spirit. Now, so these guys told to depart from the Lord. They did not have a relationship with God, which is a spirit. God is a spirit. And therefore, they did not do his will. They did not hear him. Okay? So they didn't, none of that stuff works for those guys. So we have the written scriptures, of course. We are to abide by the written scriptures. Like, we don't necessarily have to hear from the Spirit of God not to commit murder, adultery, stuff like that. It's written. These are some rules. Uh, But hearing from the Spirit is a little bit different, okay? I don't think the Lord wants us to drop to our knees and ask him if it's okay to murder someone. The scriptures are pretty clear. There's the written word, and then there's the uh, rhema word. You know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's speaking from heaven today. So we're supposed to walk after the Spirit. This does not let the Christian off the hook just by the written word. I want to give you an example here. Remember the relationship part of the equation. I've got to drive this home. Christians have a relationship with the Spirit of God. Now, if we read the Bible without the relationship with Christ, then we fall into the same trap that Saul did. Remember Saul? You hear me teach on this quite often. One of the other things I reflect upon is Acts chapter 9. Saul went about killing Christians using the written word. Okay, but he did not have the spirit of truth illuminating the scripture for him. You know, he was killing people in the name of God. He was on the remote the road to Damascus that one day and he met Jesus. He finally met the author and finisher of our faith and he developed a relationship with Christ. You hear Paul over and over talking about we got to follow the spirit of truth. You know, we got to follow the spirit. You'll notice that he then follows dreams, and he hears from angels and all that stuff. So Saul went from killing Christians using the word, and he was doing that through carnal deduction. He thought he was right. Paul was sincere in his faith. Or Saul, Paul, you know, when I do that, it's interchangeable. He was changed from Saul to Paul. So he was sincere in his faith, but he was sincerely wrong. You hear me say over and over again, it takes the Spirit of God to understand the written word of God. We can't understand it without the spirit of truth guiding us into all truth. Now, in in this Acts chapter 9 encounter, Saul starts writing about how we have to follow the spirit. 
I just want you to, you know, just rehearse those scriptures in mind. Paul's always talking about following the Spirit after that. So, in one of the ways to hear from God is to meditate in his precepts. You know, Psalm 119, 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect into his ways. If we are, um, I read today in the Purpose Driven Life devotional, you know, if you know how to worry, you already know how to meditate. Just change it basically from worrying about your f- future to, to thinking on scriptures. It's, you know, put it on autopilot. And this is one of the reasons I say dig deeper and go higher. When we take a few precepts, a few biblical precepts, and then we stretch them and pull them and just think about them and like, what does this mean? And we focus on each and every word. We go to its each word. We just take it to its its fullest proportion that we can. We go to the outer edges of what that word may mean. When we start thinking on things like this within the confines of the totality of Scripture, the Spirit of Truth will sometimes illuminate something that we didn't see before. He will drop something in our spirit. He will guide us into some truth. And it's an amazing encounter because you are having a dialogue with God. It's an amazing experience. So now I'm willing to bet that these people who were prophesying casting out demons and doing miracles, I bet they read their Bibles. I bet they read their Bibles. Notice that they they know to call Jesus Lord. Just like Saul, they went about doing things they thought the Bible was articulating, but notice it was not the will of God. Okay? It was, these acts that they were doing were not the will of God. Remember that only those that do the will of the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to read Matthew 7, 21 through 23 again. And I want you to pay particular attention. You have to do the will of God. You have to do the will of the Father, which is in heaven. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So let's go on to the point that I've never really heard anyone say before, and I got it during prayer. The Lord was highlighting, he was illuminating this to me very recently, and I I wanted to share it with you. Let's say that not doing the will of the Father is the same as working iniquity. Let me put it a different way disobeying the Father, which is in heaven, is working iniquity. I'm going to repeat it. Disobeying the Father, which is in heaven, he is in heaven, and he is a spirit, is possibly working iniquity. I want you to explore that with me. I hope you're catching the football that I'm throwing here. (laughs) The people prophesying, casting out demons, and doing miracles were disobeying the Father. Notice how Jesus says, you know, they're, they're not going to the kingdom of heaven. They disobeyed the Father. Only those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to explore some supporting concepts here just to help shore up this point. And here's a good example. Let's talk about prophesying. Now, these people were prophesying, but how could prophesying be working iniquity? Well, the answer is pretty simple, actually. If God didn't tell you to prophesy, then you're you're disobeying him. You're working iniquity. You are being in rebellion by prophesying. (laughs) Do you understand that? Okay. Let let me, uh, I want you to just, I mean, I want you to explore this with me. Jeremiah 14, 14 through 16. Then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. Ring a bell. They prophesied in his name, okay? Continuing on, I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them, they prophesy unto you a false vision and a divination, a thing of naught, and the deceit of their own heart, okay? Notice here the prophets prophesy lies in his name. Notice that God did not send them. God did not command them. They didn't even hear God. He said, I didn't even talk to him. Okay? They're prophesying a false vision, something that comes out of their heart. These prophets did not have a relationship. Verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord, concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy 
shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Notice there's some wickedness here. Now this is pretty easy. These prophets are not hearing from God, yet they prophesied. The Lord did not command them to prophesy, yet they prophesied. They didn't hear from God. They made it up. They prophesied lies out of their own hearts. And I want to caution you something else, something very, very important. The people that listen to these prophets are in big trouble. Did you catch that last verse that I read there? The people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them. Them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will put wickedness upon them. So people, we need to be very careful which prophets we listen to. It isn't just the prophet that gets penalized. You know, like when we sin, it's not just us that pays the penalty. It, the people that you know, there's other people. Remember how when David sinned, just by counting people, he, David counted Israel, and it doesn't sound like a big deal, but God didn't tell him to, and he paid a huge penalty for that. A lot of people died because of David's disobedience. He did, he did something without hearing from God. See what I'm saying? This is very important. Okay, so these prophets, they were prophesying and working iniquity by not hearing from God, not having a relationship with him and not doing what God had commanded. Now, by the way, since we're talking about prophetic stuff, I want to plug the prophetic community over on Google+. If you're interested in the prophetic, anything from eschatology, or just hearing the voice of God, or operating out of the spiritual gifts, we would love to have you. You can go to gplus.to forward slash prophetic. That's gplus.to forward slash prophetic. We would love to have you. It's a lot of fun. Great community over there. Let's take a look at casting out demons. How on earth can casting out a demon be construed with working iniquity? And guess what? It's not really a hard point to prove. I was praying about it. There's a scripture that tells us that we're supposed that that we can cast out demons. In Mark 16:17, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. Now, I'm going to read it again. Because I want, I want you to pick up something here. And these signs shall fall on them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Notice that Jesus didn't say they're going to cast out every demon that they encounter. It wasn't a commandment to cast out every demon. Remember Paul? Remember Paul when he was uh, being plagued with the demon girl with the spirit of divination? And it took him several days to finally go ahead and cast that devil out. In Acts 16:16 16, 16 through 18, and it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned again and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Now, for the rest of the story there, because Paul, because Paul cast this demon out, he was thrown into prison. Remember him and Silas both went into prison. And my point here is that Paul didn't immediately cast this spirit of divination out. It took him a few days. And he walks, you know, Paul walks after the spirit. They were meeting at a place of prayer, okay? So he was praying. Now, how can casting out a a demon be working iniquity. Well, just remember the story. He cast out the demon, and then he was thrown into prison. So there was a result there. There was a penalty kind of for doing it. And I'm not sure, you know, Paul probably heard from God, I'm not, or maybe he just got upset and used his authority. But I have a friend of mine, and this story reminded me of a friend. He ran across a demon-possessed man. And he asked the Lord, he prayed to the Lord, you know, pray without ceasing. We always need to be fellowship with the Spirit of God because our ministry is 24 hours a day. And he asked the Lord, as he ran across this man, if it was okay to cast the demon out. The Lord clearly told him that it was okay if he became responsible for that person afterwards. You know, like take him home, like the Good Samaritan. You got to take the guy home and mentor him. 
Okay, so that was the deal. If he cast him out and just left him alone, then there'd be a problem. So he didn't. And here's the good reasoning behind it. I'm sure you all know this scripture here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from which I came out. And when he's come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now, if you're being a Christian cowboy and you're just operating on your own, you're not following the spirit, and you just run around casting out demons because you can, you might be working iniquity here. Now, once a demon is cast out, if that person is not filled with the spirit of God and the word of God, he's going to end up being worse off. And you caused it. You you actually harmed this person by casting out a demon because what you're doing is you're opening it up for seven other spirits to come in. It'll be your fault. You didn't pray to God to determine his will in the situation. You did this person more harm than helping them. So as far as casting out demons, it might be a good idea to pray without ceasing and check with the Father. Now, how can, be, how can doing miracles be working iniquity? Isn't that interesting? This shouldn't be too hard, though. Even the Antichrist will do miracles. I mean, he calls down fire from heaven, and he's mimicking Elijah's miracles, you know, because it says uh, in Malachi that uh, the prophet Elijah will come for the, the day of the Lord. So people are looking forward to that. They're looking forward to someone who can bring fire down from heaven. And, you know, his disciples even did that. In, in, uh, in Luke nine fifty four through 56, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and he rebuked them. He says, You know not what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then they went off into another village. The disciples were catching on that they need to consult with God before they do something. They need to hear from God. Just like Peter, Peter was catching this catching on to this. He understood that he needed word. That's why when Jesus was walking on water, he goes, "Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a command from God and then I can walk on water too." He says, "Lord, if it be you, command me that I come out there on the water." And then he had he had a word from God. So they knew to consult, with, and then, then he could walk on water. So Peter knows that you need a word from the Lord before you do something. And also notice that the spirit, so he talks to them about they don't know what type of spirit they were of. They thought it would have been correct to kill these people with fire, <laughs> you know, like Elijah did. They thought, hey, it's a biblical precept. It's a biblical thing. Elijah called down fire. You know, if I be a man of God, may, may fire fall from heaven and consume thee in thy 50. So there is a biblical precedent for it, but they needed to hear from Jesus Christ. We need to do that today. This podcast is about relationship, hearing, and obeying. You know, I've had many supernatural experiences since I was a small child. Things like astral projection, telekinesis, poltergeist, levitation, just to name a few. And naively, I thought that since the church was based on a supernatural book, that they would readily offer me supernatural answers to my supernatural questions. However, instead of answers, I received rejection. So I began a relentless quest for truth, and in my quest for truth, I sought answers from the New Age, from various religions, the Eastern religions, and I delved heavily into the paranormal sciences. Finally, one day on my journey, I encountered the truth. The truth opened my eyes to yet another supernatural dimension that few experience. In my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey, I catalog many of my supernatural experiences. Now, while many books have been written on the soulish dimensions, I venture further and I talk about what it takes to see the kingdom of heaven. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey. Now, the reason I'm doing this particular podcast is this teaching was illuminated to me when I was meditating on a healing that the Lord did. An elderly lady, this was back in the 90s, she was in the hospital and she was not expected to survive. 
she had some lung problems. I don't remember exactly what it was, but emphysema or something like that. So here she was surrounded with her family members, and it was, you know, kind of like saying goodbye type thing. And I was the only believer in the room. The Spirit of God, I mean, I was just sitting there and just standing there, actually, and the Spirit of God told me to go pray for her and lay hands on her. So I overcame my, you know, I'm like, hey, can I pray for you? I walk up, of course, you know, so I, I pray for her. And she recovered the next day. And one of the awesome things is when I we came the next day, and she was much better, and she, she like, leave, left the hospital the day after that. But when we come... When I came in to see her, <laughs> she knew what was up because she grabbed my hand and said, let's pray. So she knew that God had healed her. So here's my point. The point I'm making is this. I had a relationship with God at that time. I heard God, and I obeyed him. I overcame any silly desire to, you know, you know how you, you don't want to look stupid in front of people? Well, if you're going to be a Christian, you're probably going to look stupid in front of people quite often. All right, so now we have some decent examples of how doing a, what seems to be a Christian good thing in the eyes of man, you know, from the carnal perspective, can be considered working iniquity in the eyes of God. In other words, we're, we're doing something against the will of the Father in heaven. I want you to meditate on that. Meditate on that because there's a lot more that I want to share with you, um, but the Spirit of Truth really needs to to touch you. Lord, I pray for the person listening to this podcast right now that they get, they catch this revelation, Father God. Touch them. Develop a relationship with them, Lord. Develop a relationship with them. In Jesus' name. Now, just remember, we need to have a relationship with God, and He's a, he's a spirit, and He's in heaven. <laughs> we got to hear from Him, too, and He's speaking from heaven. Finally, we must obey Okay? Till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher. Conrad Rocks is supported by its listeners and by its blog readers. That means people just like you. You can support Conrad Rocks by PayPal or by credit card. You'll find the contribution widget conveniently located in the sidebar of conradrocks.net. If this ministry has touched your life, please prayerfully consider an offering. And remember... Jesus, Jesus rules. rules.